I am so excited to be here with one of the greats of Notre Dame, Ruth Riley. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you. It's You're great welcome. to be here. So you grew up not that far from here, right, in a small town. What's, what's that? Tell us about that. Yeah, Macy, Indiana, right in between here in Indianapolis, population 206 the last I checked. Wow. Yeah, so a small town indeed. You could have gone anywhere. How did Notre Dame get on your radar screen? How did you end up here? Yeah, I was weighing, obviously, all the options. And the first thing you do is list out your priorities of what you're looking for uh, in a school and in a program. And for me, the academic and athletic excellence with the faith component, I mean, there is no, no better fit um, for me than, obviously, Notre Dame. And uh, it exceeded any expectations or hopes and dreams that I had for a school. So that's a big transition from 206 to Notre Dame. What was that like? What was that, that changeover for you? It was. Um, yeah, my, I think my graduating class was 83 and definitely the tallest girl in, in school. And, uh, and so for me, fortunately, it was close to home, so there's a comfortability factor. But I think coming here just really broadened my horizons. My teammates were an immediate family from all different walks of life. And I think it just really shaped my paradigm of, of a world in a different way. And I was incredibly shy. So anyone who knew me, uh, especially my freshman year, um, I think, you know, just really shy, but started to, to really open up. Uh, basketball obviously was a, a huge help in, in developing me as a, as a, as a woman and um, really loved my time here. So that team. So you played um, four years, but the first three years, couple of appearances in the Sweet 16, and then you got to your senior year. Did you have any idea what might be coming up? Well, I, I had an idea of what our goal was, and I think senior year was a laser focus on understanding. We had one more year to, to achieve what we had set out to do, and I think that everything that I learned, especially losing early in the tournament the year before, losing in the Sweet 16 the first year as we got to the tournament, I think that we exceeded people's expectations my freshman year, and so I think that gave me a hint of what I could do the next three years, but um, unfortunately, junior year fell short, and that really, I think Niel and I, and our we had five seniors, um, and you know, it was really just um, a laser focus, and there was a lot of first during that year, obviously the first time a number one ranking, the first time we were able to, to beat UConn at home in a sellout crowd, but I think Woo! even through all that, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> even through all that, the end goal was always to win a championship, and so I think that that was the difference for us in that season. So, so you beat UConn at home, and you're still smiling, and, um, and then later that season, they edged you guys out, right? But then you got another chance to come back and play them again. What was that game like? Yeah, we lost to them uh, on a buzzer beater in the, in the Big East final. And that was, it could have been a, a heartbreaking um, moment going into the tournament. But I think the reality was um, we knew that that wasn't our end goal. And so um, anytime you beat Connecticut, though, uh, you're gonna you're gonna feel good about that. I mean, that's the great thing about having a rivalry, and having a, a rival that's so good that makes you better, that elevates your game. So every time you step onto the court against someone like that, um, you you there's just a different edge for the players, for the fans, um, and it's it's something beautiful about college sports. But uh, I think that losing was a you know a disappointment in the moment. But ultimately, I think we had the confidence when the time came, even though that was a huge deficit. Well, and to at overcome. one point, you, you trailed by 15 points in the game, and you ended up winning by 15. What, a, what sparked that comeback? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think that it helped that uh, you know, we really just stuck together. Uh, I think going into halftime, you have 20 minutes, you have to lay it all on the line. And uh, I think, again, we had gone through so much. I mean, that, that team. You know, we had that core together for so long that there was real trust and belief in each other. Uh, obviously, Muffet's gonna gonna prepare us well um, in order to step onto the court, and then you have to go out and make plays. And you have an opportunity of 20 minutes. Um, obviously, we came out in the third quarter. Back then, it was just a 20-minute half. Um, 
you know, we were able to, to narrow that gap and then just kept rolling. So then you faced Purdue in an all Indiana national championship game and, and, and you struggled a little in that game. What did Muffet say to you? Do you remember that in the locker room to get you guys so fired up in the second half? Another practice run there. Um, I wish I could say that I remember what, what Muffet, her, her words, but I think everything that, that coach said prepared us. So I have no doubt that what she said in that moment was exactly what we needed to hear. Um, but it was it was a close game, and this pretty was a, a good team, someone we had faced earlier in that year. And, um, and coach is just masterful at making sure that we are prepared for the moment, making the adjustments in the games, and – and I think uh, ultimately, though, as a player, you will have to go out and, and make plays. So let's take a look at the end of that national championship game. You go to the line with 5.8 seconds left. Oh. Ruth Ryder was 10 of 14 on the night from the free throw line. And when she was fouled with under six seconds to play, she did what she had always done. She knocked them down. A last second shot by Katie Douglas glanced off the rim. And the Notre Dame women's basketball team had won the NCAA tournament. 34 and 2 overall, 15 and 1 in the Big East, and the national championship. 2000 2001, the greatest year and the greatest team in Notre Dame women's basketball history. So you hit the free throws and you're on top of the world, but you know you have one more defensive stop before you can actually call it your game. What, how, how did you keep so much control during that time? And what were you thinking? Uh, thinking that, obviously, we hope we get a stop and, and trying to figure out you know, where, where they're trying to go with the ball. Uh, back then, you can't call a timeout and advance the ball. We didn't have any timeouts left. so. Um, you definitely had to find your man quickly. We knew that going into my second free throw, they had called a timeout in between the first and second to, to try to ice me and, and call a play. But um, So we knew what our job was. They still got a good look at it, obviously, but we were able to, to get enough defensive pressure in there uh, to come away with the win. After the game, Muffet was quoted as saying, it's the same play we've been running all season. It's called Get the Ball to Ruth, end quote. That's my favorite play. What did it mean to you that your coach had that level of confidence in you to have that be the play? Well, I, I, that's the beauty about Muffet is that um, she gives you opportunity. She, you know, you, you have the chance as a player to, to develop, to grow your game, and to, to make the most of it. And really, she allowed Neil and I to lead in a way that senior year um, on the court. And for me, um, you know, to have a point guard as your head coach trust in your post player to call that play, we don't see a lot of post play anymore these days. So I think, I think unfortunately, you know, the, the play nowadays is, um, is, a little, is a little different than what we saw back then. But I think for me, she ultimately had the trust in me. And I think that gave me the confidence to go out and perform. And I think that's one of her greatest strengths is that she empowers her players. And as we've also seen, she empowers women across the world. So before we go on to what you did when you're done, Muffet has, has said sometimes that she thinks her coaching has changed over the years. When you watch her coach now versus then, what are the differences? Well, what hasn't changed is her ability to squat in those heels on the sideline. I still don't know how she does that. Yeah. But um, she has evolved as a coach, and that's why she's a Hall of Famer. And that's why she's so masterful at what she does, because players have evolved. The game has evolved. And how you recruit athletes nowadays, how you uh, teach them the, the offensive and defensive structures. I mean, we played a, a two-three zone. Uh, I don't think you're going to see that in, in the college anymore uh, nowadays. And so I think, you know, she's brilliant at X's and O's and execution points and um, to be able to, to evolve that. Um, and she caters that to the talent she had. Obviously, what she ran last year with, with five WNBA players um, on her starting five to what she's going to run this year is going to be different. And so I think that's why she is so good. So then you were drafted by the Miami Soul two years, is that right? And then... Yeah. They folded. What was that like? 
Well, it was a it was a culture shock. It was it was surprising for me. I just got a place in Miami, which is ultimately became my home base. So I, you know, very fortunate to there. I'm back there in Miami now, and so I think starting there was a perfect place for me to start. Um, but having it fold ultimately was a perfect place for me to go next, and that was to Detroit. And so, um, what going through that process as a player allowed me to, to really rethink the business structure of the WNBA. And I think that was a catalyst for me to want to get involved in leadership, want to get involved in the union, want to understand what is the business model of our league. We're very young. That was the fifth year of the WNBA. And I knew that I wanted to be an active part participant in growing our game and growing our league. And so I think had I not gone through that, that fold and an expansion experience, I probably wouldn't have been as committed to that aspect of of the WNBA. So then you went to Detroit. And Detroit had a really tough seasons before that. Yeah. And then you appear. What happened? Well, we had a, a former Domer, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, as the head coach, and, and Bill Lambier. And so if anybody has heard of Bill Lambier or knows Bill Lambier or has watched Bill Lambier play, he's exactly what you would expect. <laughs> yes. He would appreciate the applause. Um, it, he is. <laughs> He is, uh, he's tough, uh, he, he's physical, he's, he is exactly what he looks like as a, as a player, and so if you were a fan of the bad boys, you probably love him. If you were a fan of anyone else in the NBA, you probably hated him. Um, but what he did was, he wasn't athletic, obviously, uh, but he was, he was incredibly intelligent. And so um, he took um, me as a post player, kind of played in his position that he played with the bad boys, with those Pistons teams, and really expanded my game. And so he was more of a facilitator, a face-up, a 15 to a three-point uh, pick-and-pop player. And so for me, that kind of took me out of a box that I was in as a low-post presence, you know, allowed me to, to expand my game. And to your original question, what was that like? We were a really young team. I mean, to go from worst in a league to first, um, was something that really hadn't happened in sports before. And because we were young, we were selfless, we didn't care who scored. Uh, we just wanted to put on our shoes, get out and run, and, and uh, we didn't care who our opponent was. We were just going to give them our best shot, and ultimately that shot landed in a championship. You, you took them to the championship, and you became the first player ever to be MVP in both the NCAA and the N WNBA championships. Oh, but that's not all. In between championships, you played for a gold medal for the US. That's quite a string. How, how did you stay humble? Because you are beautifully humble, and somebody that will, and we'll talk about this, somebody that gives back so much. How, how did you retain that part of you? Well, I, I think uh, my faith keeps me grounded. And so that's a huge part of my life. And I think that um, for me, my faith gave me the opportunity to, to really just leave it out on the line. I could compete without fear of failure. It didn't matter the wins or losses. I wanted to, to give it all, really not for anything but the glory of, of God and the glory of, of the position he put me in. And I think there's also beauty in playing a team sport because it isn't about you. It's about what you collectively can do, how you can empower your teammates, how they empower you to, to, to bring out the best in each other. And so um, I would say how I was raised is another big part. If you've ever known my mom, I think staying humble, you, you would understand quickly that if, if she ever thought I, I was getting uh, overconfident, um, she would quickly let me know. <laughs> so Bill Lambier, Muffet McGraw, totally different coaching <laughs> styles. Yes. Share, share some thoughts on that. I mean, they couldn't be more opposite in stature and personality. Um, I, I think that, I mean, the, the two things they have in common are, are Notre Dame and, and they're both incredibly intelligent and, and, and different, different styles of delivery, though, obviously. I mean, Muffet does have that, that Philly, fiery spirit in her, and, and Bill has a very loud, obnoxious, straightforward tone. But... Um, uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, they, they both brought out the best in you, but in very different ways. So it's so many questions. There's just, um, <laughs> but I, what, what, I, what I do want to talk about is you were the first female analyst in 31-year history of the franchise when you were hired by the Heat. That was, you were really breaking ground. 
What was that like? It was, I felt like a rookie all over again, uh, in going into, you know, the NBA in that capacity and, um, you know, becoming a, an analyst. I think as a player, I've always kind of thought the game as a point guard, as a coach, more analytical than, than, um, probably just, you know, getting out and, and playing depending on my athleticism or raw talent. I definitely would think through the game. So I think that that helped me as an analyst. Um, but it is, it's not easy. When you walk into the room, you're the only female, and that's, that's happened uh, countless times throughout my career. It's a, you know, going from executive NBA here to general manager of, of the San Antonio Stars. And, you know, the, those situations I'm in management, and I am the, the only female in the room, but I think that's where Moffitt and Notre Dame has taught me the value of, of worth and the value of worth of women. And I think um, that's something that I learned early on here at, at Notre Dame. Did you, did you ever have to say anything to somebody who was maybe giving you a hard time? Put your shorts on, I'll, I'll, I'll take you on in a game of one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I don't feel like I have to prove myself. Yeah. And so I, I think that I've heard those comments my entire career. I mean, everywhere you go, somebody's like, I could post you up, I could take you. And you know, my comment is usually, I, I don't want to do that to you because that, that would be unfortunate on your part or it would be a block party. <laughs> And we could invite a lot of people to that block party, but I don't think that you're going to end up on the, the, the good side of that. But um, no, I think that there's the reality to women's sports nowadays where you could w walk into a sports bar and the average guy sitting there um, thinks that he can beat you. And these are the elite athletes in the world. So there's a disconnect, I think, still in, in respect uh, of women. I think we're coming. Uh, a, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Speaking of respect, um, we all have great respect for you, and obviously um, it's widely shared. You were inducted this year into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. Along, and, and tell, t tell us a little bit about that. Oh, it's just a, a tremendous honor. Um, something I would have never dreamed of growing up on a farm that I would, um, my career would have that kind of impact and that I would have that kind of experience to travel the world through sports and what I was able to accomplish through that. And when you walk through the Hall of Fame, you see just the history of women's basketball, the women that, and men who, who came before us, um, paved the way. Coach Merga obviously is in there, so it's fun to celebrate with her. Um, but for me, it was a really surreal and humbling uh, experience. Stepping away from basketball because you are so much more than a basketball player and um, nothing but nets, what, a, what an incredible charity. You've done a number of different charitable endeavors in your life. Can you share one or two of those and what they've meant to you? Sure. I think uh, the two kind of biggest umbrellas are the work that I have done throughout the continent of Africa when it comes to malaria or HIV prevention. And just to see how the platform of sports, you may not be able to, to, to speak a language, but you can, you know, that gives me credibility when I step into the door and then they see that I'm there because I care that the NBA or the United Nations Foundations or other partners are there uh, to provide life-saving resources. And so um, that has really, you know, been, a, I guess, um, impactful and inspirational to me to see how I can do that. And then here in the United States, No Kid Hungry is a hunger awareness campaign. A lot of people don't understand the reality of hunger in our country because it's something that people don't talk about, the stigma around that. And so... That's something that I, I try to do locally and, and nationally here in the U.S. You have a great passion for giving back, and you talked about that in your Hall of Fame induction. We have a clip that we'd like to share. My life as a professional athlete has always been about something greater than the sport itself. Notre Dame taught me that service is a choice, a commitment, and ultimately for me, a calling. It would be easy for someone to look at my height and my journey and say that it was simply destiny. It was an arbitrary chain of events determined by fate. But I believe that my life was designed for a specific purpose. And it has been my intent to live a purposeful and purpose-filled life to the best of my ability. And speaking of a purposeful life, on a personal level, some people know you only as Ruth Riley. But 
You've added another name, right? That's, yes, one of the greatest gifts Notre Dame has ever given me is, is my husband, Ben Hunter, over here. And uh, a couple of years older than me uh, on the football team and just really loves me in ways I never knew were possible and makes me a better, better woman in ways I could have never imagined. Did you know each other when you were here? Well, he, he said he tried to say hi once. I told him he should have tried a little harder. <laughs> um, but we did have a lot of mutual friends uh, throughout our, our athletic um, circles, but we, we didn't connect. We connected when we came back for a, um, at a football reunion and was hanging out with his friends, and the idea came to him that um, he should reach out to me. And so through our mutual friends, he did, and... It's been a blessing ever since. How long ago was that? We've been married a year and a half. It's been probably about um, three years now since we've been reconnected. And um, this is our first football game back together, which is really exciting for us. That's great. Great. Welcome. Um, I, I, could, I could just, I have all kinds of questions, but I know that you probably have a few questions. And so we've got microphones. Anybody that wants to ask a question, um, just raise your hand. Yep, yeah, right over here. Um, I'm just curious, um, coming from such a small town as you did, um, how, how important was that to the, the type of uh, game you played and to transfer into a, uni a bigger university and, um, and make that kind of um, athletic um, change? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I often would say to coach, I don't know how you recruited me. I wouldn't recruited myself coming out of high school. Um, but she saw something in me potential-wise and understood the opportunity that I think she believed in my work ethic and understood the potential that I had. And so my freshman year was the hardest. It was a, it was a transition. I didn't. I barely saw playing time the first probably fourth of the games of the season. And I've never spent more time working on my game than I did my freshman year throughout my entire career. And so I think um, I've always believed in the value of hard work and not, not being able to have a smooth transition just made me work harder to try to step up my game to compete at this level. Hi. Coach McGraw, last year talked about empowering women and how essential that was, how large a need that was. Any thoughts on coming back and giving some talks related to that topic? Yeah, I've, I've been, well, very blessed to come back um, growing up here. I think I, I probably get back here more than most and um, just had, we have a great network of Notre Dame Women's Connect and I was in Chicago in July, with a lot of our indie um, female alumni and potential students. And so there's an incredible network within the Notre Dame family, whether they're alumni or, or students looking to come here. And I think that they realize that uh, empowerment isn't just words. It's not just shining the light on inequality. It's, it's, it's building confidence. It's giving them resources, giving them opportunity. And I think Notre Dame does that really well, not just here on campus, but um, really everywhere that I've been. Uh, what can be done that's not being done already to help promote the growth of the women's pro basketball game? Wow, I, don't get me started on that, but I will answer the short answer to that one. Uh, I think it largely has to do first with marketing. Uh, I think um, if you're not showing quality highlights of, of the talent and the capacity of women and you turn on a TV and, and you don't see the amazing um, play that they're, they're capable of. I mean, these are the best women in the world playing this sport. And you turn on a TV and you see them shoot a layup and a highlight that doesn't register as uh, professional athletes. Um, you know, my 11-year-old nephew can shoot a layup. And so I think it's how you're marketing uh, the team, whether it's, it's on television or in your, in your local markets. But uh, you've got to get people in the stands. Um, playing the summer is hard because I realize that people are busy and the WBA season is during in the summer, but uh, people can't just say they support the league and not show up. And so I think that 
um, you know, actually physically going to games, um, getting the ticket sales up. And then lastly, the small markets are, are because every team is mostly independently owned now. Um, you have to really understand your market and the business model to make it work. A quick question. I, I know you have a great career here at Notre Dame, but do you have any contact with current like women's Notre Dame players or recent graduates in the WNBA? And do you play any kind of mentorship role for any of them? Well, thanks, Joe. I appreciate that question. <laughs> um, I have been blessed, especially when I was back here uh, for my executive MBA. I graduated in 2016 and spent a lot of time around our program. And so that was just great for me to, I mean, honestly, just I feel like a proud you know, family member to see where our program has gone. I mean, the final four runs and, and all that they've been able to do, but um, just to be a resource. I think for them to know that I'm here for them, I'm available, just words of encouragement, whatever it can be. Um, and wow, they have been fun to watch. So uh, I'm going to throw one in. What about, uh, what did you think about your teammate going to uh, Memphis? God, Miel's so proud of her. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's ironic because after... Um, she got hired. A lot of my friends in the NBA were like, you didn't tell me uh, Neil was going to make the jump. I think there's a lot of, of exponential uh, interest after the fact. I mean, because people understand how valuable she is, how talented she is. Um, and we play Memphis the first game of the, of the season at home is our home opener. So I get to see um, one of her first games. So I'm excited to be there to physically cheer her on. And, and you played with her, so and you've watched her coach. What, what, what skills and talent is she going to bring to that coaching staff that they don't have? Well, I think just having a female in the room gives a diversity of thought. And she has a unique experience from her playing career in college to, to her playing career in the WNBA to her ability to coach and relate to this generation of athletes. And so, I mean... That is, that is a unique perspective that Neil's going to be able to bring. And also, when you haven't been in the NBA for a long time and you're an outsider coming in, you can challenge the norms in a way, in a healthy way, to say, are we, why are we doing the things that we've always done? Is there a better way to do them? Uh, and so I think she's, I'm just so excited for her. I think she's going to be a great asset for the Memphis Grizzlies. That's great. Do you have more questions? I just want to say thanks. Thanks, you know, thanks for the interview. But more than that, thanks for being such an incredible role model for all of us and for making Notre Dame so proud and for always being quick to say yes when Notre Dame asks. Thanks for that. I appreciate that, Dolly. Thank you. And I just want to say I have been blessed. I've played around the world and everywhere I've gone, I've had Notre Dame alum and family support me in ways that my my teammates have an experience. And so there's something real and tangible about um, our Notre Dame family. And I just want to say, at least I get to say to you guys personally, thank you. I appreciate the support over my, over my course of my career. Thank you.